Hi, everybody. Welcome back to It's Not Magic, our podcast from Sixth Street. We invite influential leaders and founders to get to the core of how they're creating innovative solutions to stand out in their industries. Look, every one of our guests is fantastic. This is not only a fantastic guest, but it's super special to me. He's a longtime friend and a mentor of mine and a trusted advisor and partner to a lot of leading global firms, including Sixth Street. When a new associate comes in today, we don't say, you know, there's this thing called the iPhone and this other <laughs> thing called the email and you need to learn how to use it. Like they are more tech savvy than, than we are when they join. And I think in a few years, that's gonna be true for generative AI yeah. also because they will have had experience yeah. in high school and college and law school using that. So really what it's about is making sure that they're using those tools in a way that supports our clients that's Michael Gersenzang. He's the managing partner of the storied global law firm Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton. Full disclosure, I started my career as a corporate lawyer at Cleary Gottlieb. I joined them out of law school. Michael, among others, but Michael played a big role for me, teaching me how to get deals done, how to draft documents, spending the time, and helping me think about not only all those technical things, but sort of what the role of a counselor is and what it means to be a, an advisor and provide real value to clients. So this is just a real special conversation and we had a real good time as you'll hear. Look, we, you're gonna hear about uh, a number of things, in particular how the law business and big law firms and Cleary Gottlieb in particular is planning and is already working on artificial intelligence. Michael and I have written a couple of articles about that and we go a little bit deeper into that topic how you teach commercialism, how you adapt your skills over your career, how you get to seats uh, because you're good at something, but then you need to be good at other things. And Michael's gonna talk about how he thought about that through his career. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation and let's get into it. Michael, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. We've been having this conversation uh, uh, on and off for 26 years or something like that. So this is super fun. Um, I was told by the podcast gurus that if you start off by saying AI, they, the robots send you like a thousand more subscribers. <laughs> so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with AI. Um, and you and I have been talking about this over the last year or so. We've even written a couple articles together about how AI is gonna change the legal business. And you can make predictions if you want. I'm more interested in rewinding the tape a year and a half, two years. You started this thing called Cleary X. How did you see that coming? How did you convene people internally, externally to kind of understand or start to understand what you'd want to do. I, I'd love to have you talk about that. Yeah. Well, I think generative AI is clearly a new thing, but technology and technology in the law is not a new thing. Right. And, you know, you can go back to very early in our careers where there were advances in technology that changed the way that we did things. Um, email, for example, changed the way that we communicate with our clients and with each other. Uh, cell phones changed a lot in terms of uh, being able to communicate more easily, but also all the time. Yeah. Uh, and we, at Cleary, we could see that technology was going to continue to change the way that we did work for clients. And so we started actually about uh, four and a half years saying, yeah. we want to create something that uh, is technology first, not technology only, but technology first in the way that we approach client service. And we thought that the best way to do that would be to create a, a standalone business, wholly owned by the firm, but that operated independently because we wanted to give it enough uh, flexibility to pursue ideas and approaches to the business that were not unduly influenced by the way that we currently. Was there a pushback internally? People were like, why are we spending money on this? This is just another fad. There, there really was not. It took some time to explain to people what we wanted to do yeah. uh, and to... Uh, explain the inevitability of technology replacing a lot of the work that humans do, and we wanted to get ahead of that and not get run over by it. So there there were some uh, presentations and discussions at partner meetings, but, but no pushback to it. Uh, and then we went out and found really a, a world-class CEO uh, to run Cleary X. It was a little bit revolutionary within our firm to have somebody we call the CEO. That's not a, right. a cultural term for us. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And, yeah. and to give her, uh, her name's Carla Swansburg, some uh, independence in the way that she hired people, compensated people, and, and, and so on. And I think in any business, but especially a new business, yeah. having a great leader is essential to your success. And so when we launched, officially launched Cleary X uh, a couple of years ago, we had Carla, we had the kind of core team. Yeah. Um, but now we've got 25 people uh, around the world, yeah. fully remote business. Yeah. 
uh, and doing client work on a regular basis. I, I should, you also have this incredible advisory board. People should go look at it. I should say, including one of my partners, Adam Korn, who's our uh, chief uh, technology officer. But um, just, I want to go back to something you said, which is the sort of like technological change over the last 30 years or whatever, where, you know, email and th th that, f talk about that. Like, did that change the practice of law or did that make things harder to do because you were doing more things more quickly and maybe not as thoroughly? And, and how is that different from this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it had a bunch of different implications. Um, part of it was, uh, allowing us to do things that we had traditionally done faster and easier, and that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes reflect on when I was a summer associate at Cleary Gottlieb, you know, 35 years ago, yeah. uh, and I spent a good part of my summer doing uh, compare rights, comparing two different documents by hand with a ruler and a felt tip pen. That's crazy. Right? Crazy. And today you press a button and you get uh, a much better and more accurate version of comparing two, two documents. Right. But I think it has impacted the pace at which we practice law. And that's um, in some ways a good thing, in many ways not a good thing, uh, because uh, the speed that we practice uh, at has sometimes replaced or eliminated really the ability to step back and really reflect on either the, the document that you're working on or the yeah. overall dynamic of the negotiation. And so I think it's been a two-edged sword, like a lot of technology. Sure. Yes. I, has it been a particular, I, I always wondered if it was a particular disadvantage for Clear Gottlieb, because Clear Gottlieb, I think, is very good at and markets itself at as the law firm that can do the most complex things. You don't do the, generally don't do the routinized run rate things. And so you weren't going to get a big benefit speeding yourselves up because that wasn't really what you were selling anyway. You were selling like harder things. So did other firms kind of get a better benefit from from going faster and, and, and doing those kinds of things? And you still kind of needed to convince people that actually you want us to think? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think our clients really do want us to think. It's <laughs> yeah. important to remind them of we that. Do. We but do. But look, I think even in high-end work, which is the work that we are aiming for and that we think we're the best suited for, there are more routine aspects of that high-end work. Yeah. And I think it's important to be able to uh, adjust the way that you approach the work so that you apply the right tools. And if the right tool is brain power and experience, that's what we want to apply. And if the right tool is uh, a machine, a technology, then we should be applying that. And we shouldn't be taking tools that don't fit just yeah. because that's the way we, quote, always do it. Yeah. Okay. I want to go back to the beginning of your career. So. One of the themes of the conversations that we've had with people across different you know, professions and, and, and experiences is, you know, sort of the thing that they get good at when they're young isn't the thing that they, they're then doing as they, you know, get older and more senior and, and sit in seats like the one you're in. Is that true of you? Like, you started even before you were at Cleary Gottlieb, you were um, you were a law clerk in The Hague at the USRN Claims Tribunal. Like. Was that just like a totally different experience or was that of a piece with becoming a transactional lawyer to where you are now? You know, I, I think that um, all of your professional experiences have a way of building on themselves. It's not always obvious how that's going to go, but I think um, we're all on a journey in terms of developing our own skills yeah. and, and abilities and the way we think about uh, our work and our role uh, in the job. And I think all of my professional experiences have, have built on that. And, and actually, I would go back uh, and not just talk about my professional experiences, but my personal experiences. Oh, yeah. You know, so I, I grew up uh, in Albany, New York, small city, state, capital. Uh, my mom taught third grade. My stepfather, with whom I grew up, had a small business repairing trucks and selling truck parts. I had no exposure as a kid uh, to big law or finance or any of those things and really no sense of those things until I got to law school. And I think a lot of people have that um, kind of experience where suddenly they're doing things that they had no prior experience to. And, and for me, uh, the way that I approached that was to say, I have to work really hard. Like that's how I'm gonna be able to be successful and compete with these other people who have a much broader experience yeah. and a much more sophisticated understanding of the world is at least I can work really hard. And I did that and I still work really hard. But over time, what I came to realize is that um, I was also, you know, as smart as most of them, smarter than some, not as smart as others, but 
it wasn't just about working hard. I actually had other tools that I could use to try to be successful. And then your career advances and you have more experience and uh, you work hard. And then you kind of realize, you know what? I have pretty good judgment. Like I can, I can take the combination of hard work and intelligence and turn that into judgment in a way that allows me to add value to clients and to firm discussions. And I think it's important to understand how it is that you're going to be successful and that it's not one thing at every stage in your career. It, it develops. And I think it's especially important for people like me who come from uh, a, a background that wasn't privileged, wasn't exposed. We talk at our firm now, um, both in the U.S. and in Europe, about kind of first generation. Yeah. Uh, and when I talk to first generation young lawyers, uh, one of the things I say to them is, listen, just because you're uncomfortable in a room doesn't mean you don't belong in that room. And sometimes you just got to accept some level of discomfort, but you belong in that room. We want you in that room and we want you to work hard to acquire experience and then to exercise judgment. And I think any of us can do that. How do you institutionalize making people feel comfortable when they come in? I, I think you have to have open conversations yeah. about what it is to be comfortable and also that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, and, and all of us have experiences either because it's something new or it's a new substantive area or new client relationship where we are uncomfortable and we work to develop relationships and comfort level. And I think that's really what it is to grow as a professional and as a person. Do you think that that's, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I was so, as I, I'll, I'll, I said up front, I was a, an associate clear Godly. I was a summer associate in 1996, and I started in 1997. And I went to orientation, and you had two, not you, you were, you were still, you were, I don't know where you were. You were an associate, I think you were probably in Europe. And um, they had a, an older partner and a younger partner. And the older partner told some, you know, the story of the firm, and it was, the, the, the words I remember are Harvard, Rhodes Scholar, Oxford, whatever, number one in their class. And I thought, you know, like you said, I'm smarter than some, but not, not as smart as others. I'm like, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. The junior partner got up and said, that's great. That's not why you're here. And he committed this incredible act of inclusion, which made me feel comfortable. And I assume everybody else who was in the room or most of the other people didn't feel comfortable. So I feel like it's been part of the DNA of Clear Gottlieb for a while. But also the story of Clear Gottlieb and lots of other big law firms is that y y there were you know, lots of women, lots of people of color coming into the into the firms out of law schools, but then they weren't being retained. And you're doing a much better job of that now. So how did you take that kind of good intentions and make it better? Yeah, yeah. Well, not I that think, you're declaring victory, but. Yeah, yeah. well, certainly not declaring yeah. victory on this. And I think it starts with asking why. Why is diversity important at a law firm or any business organization? And why aren't we achieving our goals there? Yeah. To me, the why of why is it important to Cleary Gottlieb is crystal clear, which is I think of uh, law firms, certainly our law firm, as a talent business. That is what we have. That's our strategy is to develop and retain right. great talent. And I look at what that means in practical terms, and it means having a diverse talent base. And that's because the best problem solvers, the best, best teams in tackling hard problems are diverse teams. They're teams that bring different perspectives and insights and experiences to the problem. Yeah. And that's what we're in the business of, is developing yeah. great teams to solve hard problems. When I talk to clients about our DEI uh, strategy and initiatives and their own, uh, the number one reason that clients give me for why it's important to them is that they think that we, they get better advice and better solutions and better service from a diverse team. And that, that's been my experience in client relationships. It's also been my experience in our internal decision-making about important business uh, questions, having a diverse team, whether it's on our executive committee or in other committees, that's really key to making good decisions. That's um, our experience as well. And that diversity can come in all kinds of different ways and, 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 and different, like, like, you know, your own background you're talking about. I didn't necessarily know any of this stuff. I wasn't to the manner born. I was, I didn't have people whispering in my ear, like what the, 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 uh, the principles of finance were. Um, but you learn it and you figure it out. And also just having that perspective and being able to kind of boil it down for people and to be able to talk about complicated things in non-complicated ways is appreciated and, and important. You know, one of the things as a client, I know that we, we like about you guys, but also just, you know, 
value in legal advice and other advices, and frankly on our own teams, is this idea of commercialism. You were talking about judgment, maybe it's a, it's a cousin of, of commercialism. Can you teach that? Can you, like, how, how do you get people to think about, I want you to think about your clients as if it's your own business and, and, and really wake up, you know, worrying about that stuff and think about how we get from here to there and not just bring up problems. Yeah, yeah. I think you can teach that. Yeah. Or I think at least you can set expectations so that people realize they need to develop that. And yeah. I think the number one uh, piece of that and something that we are very focused on is, do you, as a young lawyer, do you understand the client's business? Have you talked to them about their business? And it's actually a great opportunity for young lawyers to talk to their counterpart, not to go to the CEO, but to go to the the junior person that's more or less at their level and say, can you just explain like how your business what you works? Yeah. What, what's important to your yeah, business? Yeah. And what are the risks in your business? And just spend that time. Yeah. Because that's how we give the best advice is in the context of understanding the business. And I think over time, uh, lawyers who do that realize that they should be tailoring their advice to what they're hearing from their clients about yeah. the business. Yeah. How do you hire for that? How do you hire for that like ability to, be, to, to go do that and be receptive and, yeah. and listen? Yeah. If I think about the personal traits that underlie that, I would say that there, there are two key ones. One is curiosity. Yeah. Hiring people that are interested in learning about other people, about the world, about businesses, that curiosity is something that you actually can identify or at least talk about in the recruiting process. And the other is enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, having approaching interactions with clients or colleagues with a sense of enthusiasm, I think is incredibly important because yeah. it signals that you are interested in what they do and you like what you're doing. And everybody wants to work with people who are interested in like what they do. Yeah. My partner, Alan Waxman, who you know, said something to me a long time ago, which uh, is in retrospect seemingly pretty obvious, but very profound, which is people like to do business with people they like, yes. you know. It's like, it just makes it more comfortable. And I, I'll, I wanna talk to you about my business and I wanna you know, help you help me. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty obvious. Okay, different stages of your career, different skills, going to be from a deal lawyer to managing teams to being a partner to being the managing partner. What's like the thing you're doing now that you just had zero preparation for? Yeah, almost all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> I, I think the thing that is different about leading an organization is uh, the range of topics and concerns and issues that you get the privilege of dealing with on a regular basis. Yeah. And if you are in a client relationship or you're leading a project team, or even if you have uh, a leadership role within an organization, but you're not the leader of the organization, you deal with a subset of things and, and those are interesting and yeah. there can be a broad range there, but there, there is, no topic that comes up at Cleary Gottlieb that I don't feel like I should understand and ultimately am responsible for. It doesn't mean I'm the only one, doesn't mean I don't take advice from other leaders, but the range of topics uh, is really incredible. And I find that very engaging and interesting and, and fun. Yeah. But, but it, it's impossible to prepare for that until you're in the seat. The, the nature of governance at a law firm generally, maybe Cleary Gottlieb in particular, you can, you can address that if you want, it's hard. Like you've got, you have 195 other partners yep. and they're all pretty smart folks and they're experts in their space and they're probably pretty opinionated and they think they can do their stuff just as well, if not better than you. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, you talk to people. Yeah. You, you just constantly talk to people. I sometimes joke that if I get to the end of the day and I'm not losing my voice, I haven't done my job. <laughs> You know, it, it's really a matter of listening to people, sharing information and ideas with them, developing consensus around uh, developments at the firm or in the legal industry or with clients, yeah. and and not deciding that there's any topic that is either too small or too big to talk to your partners about. Interesting. And and that was a early lesson for me actually in my uh, time as as managing partner. I've been in the seat now coming to the end of my seventh year right. in the role. Um, and I realized pretty quickly through making some mistakes 
that I couldn't really predict what topics within the firm were going to be important to partners and unimportant to partners. And I would sometimes have a topic that I thought, well, this is a minor thing. Let's just do this. Yeah. And then suddenly people would wait, what? We didn't talk about this. And sometimes there'd be big things where I thought, oh, we're going to spend weeks and weeks on this. And it actually, you know, in a matter of a few hours, the consensus had, had emerged. Well, what's the lesson learned there? I mean, is there a theme to that? I think the theme is you got to constantly engage with people across different topics yeah. and not self-select for what you think they should be concerned about or should want to know. Just be very transparent. Because people will react to them, the, the perception that you're, you're managing them? Yes. That you're ma- managing what they are. That they're, not, that they're not included in the discussion yeah. or you'll, you'll just miss the fact that something that seems unimportant to you is actually important to some of your partners. Interesting. And, and you can miss that. But you have to prioritize, right? You can't, I mean, I, I'm actually interested by the idea that like, there's no thing that's too small. There are some things that you can't, you're, you're one person with, I mean, you have a committee and you have people, but you have to kind of drive it. So how do you prioritize? How do you, how do you organize? I mean, the prosaic, how do you organize your time? Yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the things that we've done successfully over the last seven years at Cleary Gottlieb is to really um, recruit and empower senior professionals, yeah. non, often non-lawyers, not partners of the firm, yeah. but people who are really running our business as an operating matter on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And uh, we've empowered them to do that. Uh, and they are a great source of guidance and information for me because there are a lot of things that I, I can't spend my time so far in the weeds, but I have people that are talented and that I trust to do that and that are open with me about things that are going well and things that, that, that aren't going well. And I think treating law firms as operating businesses and taking pride in operating and running a very um, – well-organized global business. You know, in the old days, lawyers took pride principally in being great lawyers, and we still do, but we also have to take pride and pursue running a great business. And that's been an important uh, development kind of uh, on our journey. But the other thing I would say, and it cuts a little bit contrary to this, um, it can be really easy, too easy, I think, for somebody in my seat to um, just hear from the same people. And yeah, to was, not uh, break through the bubble. Right, so how do you do that? You, you, arrive, you arrive in whatever, you've got 16 offices, you arrive in some city somewhere, uh, and okay, the managing partner's in town. What are you doing to like really hear what's going on? Yeah. First of all, I'm preparing for that visit yeah. by talking to people in that office and people in other offices or in other parts of our business about what do they think is going on? Yeah. Who are the key clients? What are the issues? What are the challenges? So yeah. I don't walk in cold. And then when I get there, I'm really walking the halls. Yeah. And I'm just popping into people's offices, not just partners, associates, yeah. and not just lawyers, but members of our professional yeah. staff, and yeah. just ask them what they're up to. You know, and, and I think that's really important. People sometimes refer to that as management by walking the halls. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's really important to gather information from as broad a variety of people as you can. It's important to have your kind of trusted advisors sure. in your kitchen cabinet, and one of the things that I've been trying to do uh, over time is not just have one set of trusted advisors or, or a kitchen cabinet, but, but many depending on the topic. Yeah. Uh, and also to try to make sure that those kitchen cabinets include our junior most partners. And, and that's, I think, uh, you, you miss, you can miss that and important themes if you're only talking to the people kind of roughly of your age seniority or your tenure yeah. at, at the firm. So breaking through the bubble in lots of different ways, I think, has been important for me. Do you do anything deliberate to make that forum one where people feel comfortable saying things that are difficult? Like, I could be, see being a junior partner being like, eh, I don't know, I'm not sure I want to say that in front of these guys. Yeah, maybe it says something about the, the Cleary culture, but you'd be surprised at how open uh, our people <laughs> are not, with me. <laughs> same, with, same with Sixth Street, but I wonder if it's a problem elsewhere. Yeah, but, yeah. but you, do have to, you do have to create a comfort level, I think, Part of that is just being a good listener yeah. and, and not reacting to everything that people say, but just sitting there and kind of sitting with the concerns, the criticism, whatever it is, and uh, avoiding the reaction that I think a lot of people have of, well, let me tell you why that's not so, or let me try to make you feel better about right. that. Right, right. And instead, just sitting with it and hearing it all out, and maybe you come back to that person in a few days or a week to offer a different perspective or talk about it some more. But I think if you are 
thinking about how you're going to react and yeah. respond, you're not really listening. Yeah, totally. Um, I feel like you're telling me something about this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really listening because I have a question about that, <laughs> which is um, we're both sitting, you know, in, in senior seats at, at, at leadership seats in, in firms. There's a lot of pressure to talk about what's going on in the world. And I don't want to talk about any particular issue because it's less interest. I mean, it's interesting, but it's less interesting than something you've given me advice on and given us advice on, on like sort of how to frame ahead of time the evaluation of whether you'll say something and whether, and, and can you talk about how you yeah. develop that? Yeah. And, and, and this is something that I think really has evolved a lot yeah. over the last seven or eight years. And I think there are different strands to it. Sure. Um, a big strand uh, was the pandemic. Yeah. Where we went from all seeing each other all the time to being, you know, at home and seeing each other on Zoom, yeah. uh, and that was terrible in in many ways. But and particularly hard for an apprenticeship business like law. Absolutely, yeah. very challenging for more junior people to kind of get the exposure and the experience that they wanted, and very hard for senior people to take a different approach in terms of how yeah. they worked with more junior people. Yeah. An important um, lesson early on the pandemic for me was the importance of communicating. Yeah. And uh, actually I spent about um, 15 months uh, record, recording a weekly message, video message that I sent to all of our people. So it's about 3,000 people around the world. Um, and some of those, when I look back at them, like I really didn't have anything to say other than, yeah, we're still all at home and this is terrible, but let me tell you about a movie that I watched this week and you might like it or what I'm cooking because I spent a lot of time cooking during the pandemic. And and I think that was really important for people to hear from me on a weekly basis. Sometimes there were more substantive things to say, but often not. And and that the power of communication during a crisis, I think, is is really cool. What were you trying to convey? Like, what were you like? You're talking about what, what was what's the dish that you made during the pandemic that you got good at? <laughs> I made a lot of pasta. Okay, so you're, ma you're making your pasta. Maybe you're making whatever. Like. When you're tell, telling people about that, what what's the Jedi sort of thing in your head that you're like, I want to make sure people take this away or get, what's the feeling you're hoping that people yeah, are getting? Yeah, I think there were two things. One is we're still a community. Right. You're still part of an organization that right. cares about you and cares uh, what you think and yeah. how you're doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and the second was a kind of a sense of hope. Like we are adapting in some pretty effective ways, surprisingly effective ways, yeah. and we are gonna get back to a new normal. I don't know what that looks like yeah. today, yeah. but I know that we are gonna get back to a new normal, and uh, there are a lot of terrible things going on in the pandemic, but we are gonna get through this. Yeah. And that's really what I was trying to convey. You know, one of the things I found during the pandemic, doing similar things, I didn't record videos, but you know, you're on the, the, the a firm wide Zoom or you're sending out messages, is the sort of performative aspect of that, especially sitting in your home office, like beaming this out to however many hundreds of households. I think being a deal lawyer is a little, there is a performance aspect to that that you're very good at, but did you feel like you had to adapt? Did you feel like you like got better at it over the time? Like, what did you do to make that more effective? Because we're not TV personalities, which will become apparent to everybody. Yes. <laughs> <Just be quick. laughs> Yes. Well, about um, two weeks into these videos, um, one of the folks on the professional team that, that uh, I work with a lot sent me one of those little light things. You remember the, yeah, sure, the sure, lights sure. and said, yeah. you got to put this behind your, you know, your camera yeah. because you're always in a shadow. So there was, like, okay. there was, there was some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other thing was to accept that it was okay to make a short video that didn't have substance in the traditional way of thinking about that, yeah. or that didn't say anything new or revelatory, but just accepting that sometimes communication is important for the sake of communication. Yeah. And, and that took me a little bit of time to kind of fully embrace. I see. Now there's another part like, of me. Like to overcome your like natural shyness of like this, people actually want to like, hear from me exactly. about Exactly, why yeah, would yeah. I record yeah. another video yeah. that yeah. says yeah. what I already said, I got nothing new to say, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but but I, I got, think that's a very important you know, message. And, yeah, yeah. and I got very good feedback from people across the firm saying, thank you so much for doing these videos. And that kind of confirmed, like, okay, yeah. this is this is valuable. Yeah, yeah. This is worth it. Yeah, yeah. We're still here. They're yes, still there. We're still here. Yeah, yeah. The, the other part of your question has to do with 
um, expectations uh, for leaders to communicate about world events. And yeah. uh, we've had more than our fair share of really terrible world events over the last few years. And I think today it is clearly the expectation among our people that when something uh, in the world happens, if it impacts them or our organization, they expect to hear from me yeah. about it. Yeah. And um, on the other hand, there are terrible things that happen almost on a daily basis, and you gotta, you, you can't send out a message every single day, it loses right? Meaning. It yeah. loses its meaning. And so I, I developed with the help of, of, of my team a kind of lens to think about that. And the principal uh, aspect of that is, does this event have a direct impact on our people? Um, and once you start putting it through that lens, you say, okay, and then what should the message say? Yeah. Like, I don't think that anybody at Cleary Gottlieb or I'm sure at Sixth Street or other well-run organizations, nobody's in doubt that we as an organization stand against hatred or racism violence. Yeah. or violence. Yeah. And if that's all that you say, then pretty quickly those messages become a look performative and not meaningful. Totally. And so if you take the lens of, okay, what does this mean for our people? Then it allows you to get past that and say, we are a community at Cleary Gottlieb. And I'm communicating today to acknowledge this terrible thing has happened in the world, but also to say, let's all recognize that this has an impact on members of our community. Yeah. And some a bigger impact than on other parts of our community. And it's incumbent on all of us to support people who are feeling the very real anguish, strain, anxiety that these events have caused. And we need to support each other and we need to have open discussions. But when people are ready to, we can't impose those discussions. Right. And we need, when we do have discussions, to approach them with respect, with civility, and more than civility, with empathy and support for each other. Yeah. And, and that has become the kind of key theme of my messages. What does this terrible event mean for our people, and how do we address that at the community level yeah. within Clear God? And let's give grace to each other and deal with each other in good faith and assume that we're, we're going to screw things up. People don't always say things the right way. And to create that bubble of, like, inside your your community and uh, you know, kind of be uh, uh, insulated from kind of the nonsense that's out there. It's, it's an important message too. I, your, your, your framework has been super helpful to help us think about. Uh, people should ask you about it um, if, uh, if you're willing to talk about it because you just did, so you are. Um, let's talk about the legal business for a second. The, the law firm business, um, something that most of the rest of the world has to deal with is hiring lateral people, like mm -hmm. bringing people who at a senior level. It's very hard. Yeah, I, I, and I think you know the, the 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 big law, and I think in particular you guys have been much slower about that because you're, we're going to talk about your culture, but your your culture is closely guarded. It's I don't mean to make it sound secretive. It's very important, and uh, to bring someone in a new, it's it's a very difficult thing to do. How, how do you how have you navigated that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Historically, we have had very few lateral partners yeah. join us. I mean, over a long period of time, one maybe two in a year, many years with no lateral partner yeah. joining us. A few years ago, we decided that as part of our efforts to achieve our you know, longer term strategic goals, we were gonna do more of that. Yeah, and the con I'm sorry, I should give people the context. The context here is that people are trading away from firms for really big amounts of money, yes. and that's kind of a new phenomenon. And anyway, so yeah. that's a hard thing not to, to try and compete with. Yes, you're absolutely right that the, um, the lateral market has changed dramatically, yeah. I would say, yeah. over the last five years. Yeah. And, and part of that is uh, eye-popping compensation offers. And another part of it, in some ways, this is, I would say, as important as compensation, is that uh, the stigma associated with a partner after many years at one firm, going to another firm, that has really eroded. Yeah, and um, I think the kind of the bonds that kept people together have been eroded, and it's I'm not happy about that, but it is a reality that individual partners think of themselves uh, more as free agents than they ever did before. Yeah, 
And at some firms, you see a lot more than that than, than others, and there's, there's a range, but uh, I think that um, has become uh, more prevalent over the last five years. For us, we decided that we wanted to be more engaged in the lateral market a few years ago. Um, and uh, 2021 was the first year uh, that we did that. We brought in five lateral partners, which frankly is is nothing compared to many of our competitors, yeah, yeah. but for us was a big deal. Yeah, sure. In the following year, 2022, we brought in seven lateral partners. Uh, and this year, you know, it'll be more like 11 uh, or 12. Um, and so that's marked a pretty significant oh. change for us in the way that we think about and approach lateral partner hiring. Um, but the thing that has been critically important for us as we've done this yeah. is the culture point. And um, we go through a very lengthy process compared to most other firms uh, that involves uh, a potential lateral partner um, meet, meeting dozens of current partners. Every partner at our firm is invited to a meeting to meet the potential lateral partner. And typically, uh, 80 or 90 partners have actually met somebody before we then have a firm meeting to discuss the candidacy and before we have a vote. And we ask partners during that process to write up a, a summary. Sorry, 80 or 90 partners will sit with a lateral candidate. Like it's in, now in, done in, by Zoom, mostly. Okay, but yeah, okay, so, yeah. okay, but still. Okay. But in small groups. In small, in small groups. groups. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and we ask the partners through that process to write up their impressions from the meeting. And what's been interesting is I would say probably 80% of the comments focus on culture. Uh -huh. I think this person would fit in well with us for the following reasons. Or I have some concerns about how this person would fit in with us for the following reason. Very few comments about, I don't understand the business case, or what's the diligence on their the, revenue their generation yeah, yeah, abilities, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Very few comments, and I think that is a testament really to how important our culture is to us, not just because it makes Clear Gottlieb but a nice place to work as a partner, but also because we recognize it as part of our strategy and part of our I want to talk, I want to talk about clients. that. I want to talk about that. So I dug up. This is from 1996 before I, I graduated law school, but it's your 50th anniversary book. Uh, so that's whatever, 27 years ago. And the, the, one of your partners, still who's still a partner of yours, wrote a piece, and there's a, it's a, there's a there's a lot in there. But he talks about um, he's confident that basically he, him as a partner, Clear Gottlieb, was the envy of others because you enjoyed the most important attribute of all: quote, absolute and uninterrupted peace, peace among partners, peace with and among associates, and peace with non-lawyers. And then the roots of the piece are, quote, lockstep compensation system, the novelty of hiring and advancement on merit alone, the array of personal eccentricities that were celebrated or at least tolerated, uh, and that resulted in having excellent lawyers and thoughtful and considerate people. Can I mean, you're saying the same thing. Basically, like, collegiality and respect is what clients want. Talk about that. Like, yeah. why? why? It's, yeah. not, it's nice to have a through line from 30 years ago. That's, yes. that's pretty cool. Yes, that, that is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And, and it's funny, one of the things that I um, started doing when I first became managing partner was going to meetings with clients, could be in the pitch, could be a relationship meeting, but meeting a broad array of clients that hadn't been part of my practice. They weren't clients that I knew from when I was a full-time practicing lawyer, but yeah. I was going to see them kind of as the managing partner of, of the firm. Yeah. And I started hearing a kind of common refrain in those meetings, usually as the meeting was starting to break up and we're kind of collecting our things, somebody, the client would say, you guys, referring to the Cleary team, you guys really seem to like each other. And what I recognized through that was that struck the client as unusual. Yeah. They, they, there was a kind of a note of surprise in their voice. You guys seem to really like each other. Yeah. And First of all, it made me a little bit sad for the legal profession that the <laughs> fact that partners in a meeting kind of clearly like each other was so unusual. But I also reflected on, well, why does that matter to the client? It was clear that it did matter to the client. They, they were noting it. And I think it matters to clients because they believe, I think rightly, that lawyers who know each other, trust each other, like each other, they're going to perform better as a team. Yeah. And that's going to be to the benefit of the clients. They're going to get the client is going to get better work, more consistent work. The 
type of work, the timing of the work, the cost of the work is not going to be affected by uh, internal tensions or squabbling among the the lawyers that are providing the service. Yeah, and, and I think that um, that really resonated with me. First of all, it, it made me realize, frankly, how lucky I've been to be at Cleary Gottlieb for thirty two plus years. Yeah, um, but also that the culture is important to our relationships with clients and our, our strategy yeah. uh, of developing deep connectivity with clients. I mean, one, one of the things that we're telling our investors and our, our prospective employees is that we really do collaborate and we do that, we try and do that at scale and we do do that at scale. And it means that we can be really, hopefully smart generalists who can kind of tackle any issue and that people aren't gonna worry about whether or not they're gonna get paid for it or whether or not it ends up in quote unquote their fund or whatever. And it really does come through when you're, when, hopefully when you, when you, when people see us interact, like we actually like each other yeah. and it's nice to have nice winners. Yes. That's what we're calling it. Nice winners. I, I, I was kind of saying the, 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 without doing a whole history lesson, the, the roots of Clear Gottlieb is post-war Europe in some ways, New York and Europe, helping forge the common market. Like, how do you think about the world now? It's kind of deglobalizing and that's kind of counter to sort of the DNA of the firm. Do you think about that? Does the firm think about that? We, we do. So, you know, as you said, um, the firm was started in New York and Washington, opening on the same day. And five years later, we opened in Paris. Yeah. Uh, and that was very much part of the uh, rebuilding effort in post-war Europe. And then we were in Brussels. But not just in Europe. You know, we, were, we opened in Hong Kong in 1980. Mm. Uh, today, uh, almost 40% of our people are outside the United States. So we really think of ourselves as one of the original and still today as the preeminent international law firm. And so that forces us, and I think any well-managed business should think about what their brand is and what's the relevance of how they approach the market to changes in the market. And so this question of, of deglobalization or decoupling uh, is an important one for us. My own view today is that deglobalization is more of a political idea than it is uh, a business idea yeah. today. Yeah. And that um, you've got big businesses that are so intertwined internationally yeah. that they're not likely to make um, significant changes in, in the sense of pulling back to becoming solely or primarily domestic businesses. Uh -huh. Now, there may be shifts in what their internationalism looks like. Right. Last week I was in Mexico City visiting clients and visiting some of the large local law firms and a very hot topic in Mexico, both for private sector and for the government, uh, is the, the nearshoring opportunity. And as I say, businesses and industries being developed or grown to take advantage of the fact that global supply chains are shifting. Right largely away from Asia, and that's a result of the pandemic, but also of political geopolitics, um, for ge sure. geopolitics. And that is going to create a real opportunity for, uh, for Mexico, for businesses and, and for uh, the government. There are lots of decisions they have to make to, to realize on that opportunity. Um, but to me, it was a good illustration of saying, well, today, the, the single best, biggest example of deglobalization is tensions between the U.S. and China, but in fact, that is going to cause a different kind of internationalism, which is U.S., Mexico, or, or maybe even Mexico, Europe, or Mexico, 100%. Asia. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think you have to really understand, uh, not just at the high level, but the details, what are the impacts going to be? But yeah. I don't think it's going to be a significant retrenchment from internationalism. Okay, so you're you're in the predictions business. That is, so this, this is good. So let let's make some predictions. So um, let's talk about the law business. Um, we and it can be like the AI lens. I think is an interesting lens, but but also otherwise. Like, what what do you think is going to be? Let, let's talk about practice groups. Do you do you, in five or ten years? Do you have litigation and M and A, or do you have industry groups that are kind of like? interdisciplinary and serving the asset management industry, the industrials, whatever. Yeah, I, I would say both. Yeah. In some ways already today, 
We have both. We have practice groups that are built around a substantive area of law, like, yeah. like tax yeah. or executive comp. We have practice groups that are built around a particular type of work, M&A or litigation. But we also have uh, overlays based on industry or client teams. And I think all of that is important and for different reasons. I think if you are trying to train junior lawyers and get them to fall in love with what we do, you need to create uh, an environment in which uh, that's going to happen. I think practice groups, substantive practice groups yeah. or, or practice area groups like litigation and M&A are really the best way to, to do that. On the other hand, if you want to deliver great client service, you need to understand the business that your client is and the industry that they're operating yeah, in. Yeah. Um, so I think you need to do all of that if you're going to be successful. The trick is to do that in a way that doesn't just create endless numbers of meetings. <laughs> and, and, and that can be a challenge because yeah. you want to share information and insights about industries and legal developments, um, but you need to give people the space to really do what we do for a living, which is to serve clients. Yeah. Will big law on average have larger footprints, more headcount or less? So that's a super interesting question. And, and I, I do have a crystal ball, but it's on this one, it's a little bit cloudy. <laughs> it's a little bit cloudy. Fair enough. Um, I think that technology uh, over time and particularly generative AI, is going to reduce the number of lawyers at the biggest law firms. But, uh, well, two things. One, I don't know what that time period is um, because we're in the very early days yeah. of generative AI. And, and second, it may well be that the lawyer headcount is replaced with technologist headcount. If I think about Cleary X and how they're approaching it, we, when we go to pitch a project, we're kind of linked arm in arm, the lawyers and the technologists and the project managers at, at Cleary X. That's how we're pitching the work and that's how we're carrying out the work. And I think we're going to see more and more of that where we have first rate technologists at Cleary Gottlieb who are part of the client team. Yeah. You know, today that's happening in small ways, but if you had to kind of define, well, what's the role of the technologist at Cleary Gottlieb? You probably would say, number one, keep the trains running. Make sure my email doesn't collapse. Right, exactly. Right? Right. But I think over time, number one is going to be making sure that we are presenting ourselves to clients yeah. as a tech-savvy, tech-enabled law firm and that we're doing the work hand-in-hand -hand with our technologists. What do you tell incoming classes to prepare for all these, you know, these new conditions? Well, I think a lot of the technology aspects, uh, we don't need to tell them anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, we, when uh, when a new associate comes in today, we don't say, you know, there's this thing called the iPhone <laughs> and this other thing called the email, and you need to learn how to use it. Like, they are more tech savvy than than we are when they join. And I think in a few years, that's going to be true for generative AI yeah. also because they will have had experience. Yeah in high school and college and law school using that. So really what it's about is making sure that they're using those tools in a way that supports our clients and that is consistent with the firm's uh, views on client confidentiality, on document security, on preserving the value of our data. Yeah. You know, those things we're going to have to teach and train and inculcate, but the basic use of technology, they're, they're coming ready for that. But in terms of like how to how to think how to think broadly, and for example, when you're talking about it, you're going to have you have a team you have a technologist or a Cleary X person on your deal teams or on your client teams, there's got to be someone who, and maybe it's the technologist, maybe it's the lawyers, maybe it's them together, translating. Like this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is what we this is where we're going. This is what I anticipate the issues are going to be. You know, so that the technologist can think, okay, I I, I understand this framework because they're not they may not be lawyers. Yeah. What. Is that a skill you can, again, is that a skill you can kind of teach or inculcate? I think so. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have used the term in, in our articles of co-piloting, yeah. right? Having lawyers work alongside technology to deliver great service to yeah. clients. And I th to me, that's a very helpful way to think about it. You know, I mean, we, we get on a lot of airplanes, both of us, right? Yeah. And when we get on the airplane, we see the human pilot, delighted to see that person, but also feel pretty good about the fact that they're alongside a computer that's helping them navigate this flight. Yes. And when I get on a plane, 
I don't want there to be just the human pilot or just the yeah, computer. Totally. I want them working together. Totally. And, and I think that's, that is the future of the practice of law. Right. Uh, and I think that we're going to have to train both the lawyers and the technologists to talk to each other and work closely together in that. But the hard part of that training, I think, is going to be in the first generation. And once you get past this first generation of co-pilots, it's going to be very normal and natural because it's going to reflect how other parts of our lives uh, are already working. Do you remember, a per uh, maybe we'll end on this, it's, it's a personal question because it's about thinking about your your background, your understanding of uh, like, okay, I can work really hard. You're, um, I can tell you as a, as a first person witness, like, you're a great trainer of people. You 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 spent a lot of time with me personally training me, which was an incredible gift for me. Who did that for you? Like, where did you where did you learn to kind of put all that together? I, I think I've been incredibly lucky in my career to have a pretty broad range of people to learn from. Yeah, um, some of them more senior than me. Some of them my level. Some more junior than me. I think I learned as much from you as you did from me, probably. So, I'm not sure about that. but but I think. And I think the key to that is being lucky when people invest in you, yeah. but recognizing the investment that they're making and trying to grab more of that. Yeah. Not taking it for granted, goes back to showing enthusiasm, like I really wanna learn this and I think you can help me learn it. Yeah. And another part of it is your own responsibility to learn, including from people that aren't trying to teach you and including from people where what you're learning is how not to do things. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really incumbent on anybody if they want to develop professionally to be a little bit of a sponge and watch what people are doing and how they're approaching things yeah. and figure out what of that you think will work for you and make you a better professional and what of it uh, you want to avoid because it doesn't feel natural to you or because you just think it's not a good idea. Yeah. But I think we, we all are on this journey of, of learning that continues for me. I mean, the day I feel like I've stopped learning how to get better is like the day for me to go read books or something. So I think it's really important that people take initiative, take responsibility for their own development and don't look for just one mentor or example. Look for dozens yeah. and figure out what you can learn from how they're doing things. Uh, Michael, thanks. This is super. Uh, we could go on for hours, and we will, but we off camera. Yes, yes, yes exactly. <laughs> All Over right. a beer. So exactly. Thank, thank you. That was Michael Gerstenzang, managing partner at Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton. We sat down in Six Street's San Francisco office on November 16th, 2023. As I've known for almost 30 years, he's such a pleasure and so thoughtful and a terrific leader. You heard us talk about AI, its role in law firms. You heard us talk about how you adapt your skills over the course of your career, that you need to get good at things uh, that you weren't necessarily good at before and you need to adapt. Uh, we talked about culture, we talked about collegiality and respect, and we talked about leadership and how communicating and listening are so important and showing vulnerability in difficult times is in particular very important and something that we've learned to grapple with over the last number of years. So Michael, as always, thank you for taking the time for sharing all of your your wisdom, not only in this conversation, but generally speaking. Our team at Sixth Street always appreciates uh, your partnership and the partnership between our two firms, and we look forward to continue working together for many years to come.